Good afternoon, Governor and Deputy Governors, members of the media and academia, and colleagues and other stakeholders working in the financial sector. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us for the launch of the second edition of the 2022 Financial Stability Review, in short, the FSR. For those of you who are not familiar with the FSR, it is a biannual publication of the Reserve Bank, released six months apart. The first edition was released in May 2022. In terms of the Financial Sector Regulation Act of 2017 and the requirements of the FSR, the Saab is required to set out in the FSR A its assessment of the stability of the domestic financial system during the six-month review period, which for this edition is from May to November 2022. B, the Saab is to provide its identification and assessment of the risks to the financial stability in at least the next 12 months or for the year ahead. Let me run you through the proceedings this afternoon. Firstly, we will start with the governor, who will provide us with some opening remarks. Thereafter, secondly, we will go to Dr. Nicola Brink, the head of the Financial Stability Department, who will take us through a presentation wherein she will highlight the key points of the second edition of the 2022 FSR. And then thirdly and finally, we'll have a Q&A session after that. So without much ado, let me hand you over to the Governor. Good afternoon. Um, let me add my words of welcome to what uh, Rushdie has already said. Uh, the intention of the uh, Financial Stability Forum is to create public awareness and encourage debate on issues that relate to financial stability in South Africa. This forum takes place every six months and allows us to unpack how global and domestic developments could affect the domestic financial sector and its ability to effectively perform its functions. The SAP's Financial Stability Review released today reflects on conditions in the financial sector. While we have moved far from the dark days of the pandemic and extraordinary policy actions taken to respond to it, today's economic and financial conditions remain shaped by it and our actions. Highly indebted households, firms and sovereigns with weak balance sheets are at risk from financial contagion and rising inflation. Policy excesses and geopolitical events have exposed weak financial positions of various economic players. Following more than a decade of low inflation and low volatility, countries are now faced with significantly higher inflation levels, an accelerated pace of policy rate normalization and high volatility in financial markets. The challenge of addressing domestic inflation in a global environment of extremely high financial volatility and geopolitical uncertainty remains with us. The tightening of financial uh, conditions globally can be seen in various market indicators. Global market depth, which uh, reflects the number of buyers and sellers in a given market, and liquidity conditions have both worsened since the release of the May 2022 Financial Stability Review, even in historically liquid markets. Liquidity premiums have also risen, increasing the risk of further volatility by amplifying the impact of adverse developments. As noted in the IMF's October 2022 Global Financial Stability Report, Rising and high inflation has become a threat to financial stability. Over-leveraged financial institutions and households could fail or default as policy rates normalize. In this environment of high debt levels, short-term tensions between monetary and financial stability policies could surface. However, while such temporary divergences can occur, the objectives of price stability and financial stability are complementary over the longer term. 
In South Africa, we continue to pay uh, particular careful attention to the risks of excessive leverage. Over the short to medium term, the financial sector is vulnerable to steps that may be taken if the deficiencies identified in the Financial Action Task Force's Mutual Evaluation Report of South Africa are not addressed in a timely manner. There was a notable increase in the number of cyber incidents reported during the review period, both globally and domestically, and financial institutions remain attractive targets. The threat of highly disruptive cyber attacks on financial institutions and market infrastructures therefore remains a concern. While the growing reliance on third party IT service providers and increased centralization of IT infrastructure could pose further risks. This edition of the FSR includes a review of these topical issues and potential emerging risks to domestic financial stability. The topics covered in this edition include, firstly, an update on the Financial Action Task Force Mutual Evaluation on South Africa and the potential financial stability implications of a grey listing by FATF. Secondly, the financial stability implications of crypto assets given the recent turmoil in crypto asset markets. Thirdly, an overview of the structures and committees that assist the SAP in executing its financial stability mandate. And fourth and last, a discussion of the South African Overnight Index Average, Zaronia, which is a benchmark that reflects the interest rate at which rent-denominated overnight wholesale funds are obtained by commercial banks. By commercial banks. Zaronia will replace the Johannesburg Interbank average rate, JIBA, as a market benchmark rate. Overall, since the publication of the previous financial stability review in May this year, systemic risk in the South African financial system has increased marginally, prompting a slight decline in the outlook for financial stability. The South African financial system has nevertheless continued to display a relatively high level of resilience under challenging conditions during the period under review. At this stage, I would like to hand over to Dr. Nicola Brink, the Head of Financial Stability Department, who will take you through a summarized version of the Financial Stability Review in a number of slides. Nicola? Good afternoon and thank you once again for the opportunity to present the contents of the Financial Stability Review. On the screen you can see the contents of my presentation at a high level, but before I get into the meaty content I would like to just um, briefly on the next slide explain the financial stability mandate of the Reserve Bank. The financial stability mandate we get from the, um, the legal mandate has been given to us in, in terms of the Financial Sector Regulation Act of 2017. And in terms of that legislation, we are mandated to protect and enhance financial stability in South Africa. So that often leads to the question of what do we mean by financial stability? And that is also defined in the Act. In short, it refers to a financial system that is capable to perform its functions without interruption, despite a change in economic circumstances. So in, right in front of the FSR, we note some characteristics of a stable financial system. Firstly, it's a system that is resilient to shocks, that efficiently intermediates funds, even in adverse conditions and in the event of shocks, and importantly, it's also a system in which the public has confidence um, that it will be able to continue performing its functions. Financial stability has got a systemic outlook. It supports and complements the primary mandate of price stability in the interest of balanced and sustainable economic growth. 
Moving on to global developments that could potentially affect stability in the South African system, we see that firstly, during the period under review, the global outlook for inflation worsened, although there have been some recent signs of possible moderation. Since the beginning of the year, the average policy rate in advanced economies, advanced economies had already increased by some 200 basis points, and as at the end of September, a further average 150 basis point increase was expected. The highest increases is expected to be in the UK and the Eurozone. That you can see uh, on the, in the left-hand slide with the dark blue bars indicating expected interest rate increases. The probability of recession has also increased according to Bloomberg data. On the left-hand side, right-hand side, you can see the probability of a recession in advanced economies increasing from less than 20% in the beginning of the year to as much as over 70% for the Eurozone with the, the UK and US slightly behind. China, which is also a growth engine globally, is experiencing a worsened growth outlook on the back of its very strict lockdown policies and issues in the property sector. And in the past few days, we've also seen very unusual episodes of civil pro protest. If we move on then, these monetary and macroeconomic developments led to high financial market volatility, pessimistic investor confidence, and the flight to safe haven assets. On the left, the turquoise bars indicate how volatility indicators for a range of riskier asset classes have increased from the time of the previous FSR, as shown by the dark blue lines above. In addition, liquidity in most of these markets have declined. This is a point that was also highlighted by the IMF in its recent Global Financial Stability Review. The combination of rising policy rates, a strong US dollar, and increased preference for safe haven investments led to a sharp increase in emerging market funding costs. The orange line in the right-hand graph shows the average US dollar denominated bond yields for emerging markets, which rose to levels not seen since the peak of the global financial crisis 14 years ago. Emerging market funding challenges are exacerbated by the maturity profile of their debt, with a high proportion of debt maturing next year. Countries like Brazil, the Magenta, India, the Green, Mexico, the uh, Turquoise, and Egypt, Yellow, are among the worst effective, affected countries. South Africa, the dark purple block, is relatively better positioned, with most of our government debt maturing only in 2026. If we then move to the domestic environment and look at some key sectoral developments, we start with financial market developments. And largely, South Africa's financial markets followed the global trends. Overall, there was an increase in volatility, lower investment returns, and lower liquidity. The bond curve remained steep and shifted higher across all maturities as interest rates globally and in South Africa increased. We suffered from capital outflows as foreign investors withdrew portfolio investments. Non-residents were net sellers of some 8 billion rand worth of South African government bonds during the period under review, and their bond holdings declined to its lowest level as a proportion of total government bond in issuance since 2011 at 26.8%. They were also, as is evident on the graph, significant net sellers of South African equities. 
Most of the government bonds sold by foreigners were taken up by South African banks. This increased not only the concentration of their holdings of bonds, but it also contributed to illiquidity and wider bid offer spreads in the financial markets. Banks often tend to have buy and hold strategies and keep bonds as part of the, their investment portfolios instead of trading them actively in the market. Moving to trends in financial institutions, we note that bank credit extension grew notably to pre-COVID levels. Between January and July of this year, bank credit grew by almost 1 trillion rand, of which almost half, or 440 billion rand, was to corporates, followed by residential mortgages, loans to other banks, and loans to government. However, credit risk indicators remain benign, suggesting that banks in aggregate are managing their credit risk exposure quite well. Liquidity metrics also indicate that banks have enough cash and liquid assets to finance expected withdrawals of deposits. In the insurance sector, profitability continues to be under pressure in this period specifically, the main cause of pressure was lower investment returns. However, their solvency ratios in aggregate remained adequate. From a financial stability perspective, we also monitor developments in the non-financial sectors of the economy to assess whether there could be material spillover effects into the financial system. A key concern is the strain that load shedding puts on already weak economic growth and the viability of corporates, in particular SMEs. Corporate liquidations continue to increase by 11.8% in the year to September 22. Combined with higher interest rates and debt service servicing costs, this affects their ability to service debt the non-financial sector's overall interest coverage ratio decreased from 5.1 to 4.8 during the period under review, but remains above the IMF benchmark of 2. So far, default indicators of banks are not yet raising financial stability concerns. Household budgets are under pressure from higher living costs and debt servicing costs and an increase in unsecured lending could be an early sign of distressed borrowing. In the real estate sector, the commercial part has had some reprieve as people return to offices and malls, but there has been a 17% increase in commercial tenants making no payments or only partial payments, and municipal costs and levies have increased significantly. House price increases slowed, but the rental market for houses has improved. Lastly, government revenue again exceeded expectations and the outlook for government debt metrics improved in the medium term budget policy statement in October, although underlying structural risks remain. This brings us to the outlook for financial stability for at least the next 12 months. We depict the outlook in the risk and vulnerability matrix of the SOAP, or sh the RVM for short, and the RVM shows the residual impact of the main risks and vulnerabilities that we identify. Let me briefly explain the concept of residual impact, because it's important for the correct imp interpretation of the RVM. Residual impact means we take into account any mitigating factors as well as the resilience of the financial sector to deal with risks and shocks. So it is possible that the risk may be very high, but because financial institutions put in a lot of effort to deal with it, the res residual impact may be assessed as relevant and the opposite, of course, can also be true. 
we have changed the RVM, the colored blocks we had before, to a more shaded approach. And this is to try to reflect the fact that there's an unavoidable degree of judgment and uncertainty in our assessment. Just as a reminder, the x-axis on, on the RVM gives an indication of the time period over which we see a risk panning out, while the y-axis gives an indication of the likelihood we attach to it materializing. Most of the risks would be pretty familiar. They have been on the RVM for some time, and the sideways arrows is an indication that we see these risks continuing. We've added two new risks, which is indicated there on, on the slide. Because the RVM is the crux of our financial stability assessment and outlook, I'll zoom into each of these risks in the next couple of slides. Slow and inequitable domestic growth has been on the radar for some time, for quite a, a long time. How it affects financial stability is by creating a challenging operating environment for financial institutions. There is dampened demand for some financial products. There is an impact on investor sentiment, investment returns, funding cost, and operational cost of financial institutions. This has the possibility of tempting financial institutions into adopting riskier business models and riskier business activities. And it may also reduce the product offering of financial institutions. For example, certain risks may over time become either totally unavailable or unaffordable to ensure if they, if they happen too often. What we see as mitigators is the profitability of financial institutions and the fact that we have a system of effective regulation and supervision. The next risk is that of global stagflation and rapid tightening of financial conditions. The impact of this risk was discussed in previous slides, so, and to some extent it links to the previous one. I'm not going to repeat all of that, just to note the mitigating factors that we have include our flexible exchange rate, the level of foreign exchange reserves, the fact that both the bank and sovereign balance sheets have got low FX mismatches and exposure relative to many other emerging markets, and then that, relatively speaking, domestic inflation expectations are still anchored. This is the first of our new risks, inefficient, insufficient and unreliable electricity supply. We've added this because of the much higher stages of load shedding during 2022, and because there does not seem to be a short-term solution. There are two channels of risk to the financial sector. The first one is the actual situation, the slow burning impact of load shedding on the economy, uh, the increase in operational costs as institutions have to make alternative plans, and the impact on businesses who are the clients of financial institutions. The second channel is the very unlikely event of a total grid blackout. This will have a much more severe effect if it should happen. However, it is a definite tail risk, and it is quite ironic that load shedding in itself is the mitigating factor against this. We note as further mitigations the announcement of actions to address the energy crisis, but these will take time, and therefore the residual impact of this risk remains quite high in our matrix. This brings us to the consequences of the adverse findings of the FATF Mutual Evaluation of South Africa. The final decision of the FATF 
mutual assessment will be made in February 2023. I think the whole sector is awaiting that very anxiously. We've written about this in the previous FSR. We've also included a note on it and an update in this edition of the FSR. We note that we note all the progress and efforts made to address the adverse findings, but some remedial act actions may not be implemented timelessly, so there is st still some risk of being grey listed. And the ultimate impact of this risk is dependent on the exact findings that will be in the final decision and recommendations. Cyber attacks on key financial institutions is an ever-present risk and risk and financial institutions have to deal with literally thousands of incidences on a, on a daily basis. The risk is exacerbated by the growing dependency on IT for transactions and communication, a growing reliance on third-party service providers, the increased concentration of IT infrastructure globally, and then also the fact that our financial institutions rely to a large extent on foreign financial market infrastructures which, that face their own challenges in this regard. Smaller institutions are relatively more exposed, but then again, if a smaller institution is attacked the, the, or successfully attacked, the probability of it becoming a systemic event is relatively lower. But there remains a, a very, very large tail risk, difficult to predict. Um, a single successful systemic attack can have crisis proportions. The risk is mitigated by the large IT security spending and the coordinated response structures in the financial sector. This is the second new risk that we added to the matrix, namely escalating global conflict and geopolitical polarization. It is the key contributor to volatility and uncertainty in the global financial sector. With all these spillover effects that have been noted earlier in the presentation. However, the residual impact over the forecast period is reduced by the fact that we have well anchored inflation expectations relative to other emerging markets and even advanced economies. We have well-regulated and resilient financial institutions in South Africa. This is also a pre-existing uh, vulnerability. We've renamed it somewhat to a sharp repricing of, of South African government debt. We've written about the high exposure of the financial sector to government debt in the past, and this continues to make institutions vulnerable to a sharp repricing in government debt instruments. Lower liquidity in the South African government bond market makes it more susceptible to large price swings or spikes in yields in the event of adverse shocks. And it reduces the ability of financial institutions to raise large amounts of liquidity in the market when needed. For these reasons, we continue to assign a high residual impact to this risk, despite the fact that there was an, a marked improvement in the government's debt profile. Lastly, we have the everlasting risk of climate change that have both physical and transitional um, effects on the financial system. The risk stem from the, the high concentration of carbon-intensive carbon activities in the South African economy, the lack of clarity around financial, the financial sector's exposure, the lack of comparable taxonomies and granular data, which makes it difficult to measure and difficult to regulate until that is in place. There is also a relatively high risk of climate-related damages that affect the insurance sector. 
The mitigants include the voluntary disclosures by some financial institutions currently. Then we also noted the presidency Jet IP or Just Energy Transition Investment Plan that was presented at the COP27 a um, little more than two weeks ago and well received. And then within the financial stability department specifically, but also in cooperation with the Prudential Authority, we are establishing a climate stress test capacity. In terms of overall assessment, not to repeat anything um, that the governor has said or that came out in the previous slides, we see an increase in systemic risk during the period under review. However, the financial system remains resilient under challenging global and domestic conditions. There are also some factors exogenous to the financial system that contributes to, um, to the risk but prudentially regulated institutions in aggregate maintain adequate capital and liquidity buffers to absorb shocks. Some of the policy measures that the SAAP takes or took to, uh, to further increase the resilience of the financial system is its col collaboration with financial sector regulators and industry to identify and address key risks. We kept the counter-cyclical capital buffer at 0% in the absence of any excessive credit growth. And we also continued to implement the strengthened resolution and deposit insurance framework to, as part of South Africa's safety net arrangements. And these are just as a reminder, the topical briefings or the briefings on selected topics that's included in chapter three of the report, also mentioned by the governor in his remarks. So I'm going to leave it at that and invite you to read that very interesting chapter in the publication itself. The publication itself is available on our website at that address. And I thank you for your attention. I hand back to the governor. Thanks, Nicola. Um, there you have it, a summarized version of the financial stability review, and we would like to open up for any questions that you uh, might have. Um, uh, Governor? Yes, Rujdi. We currently have um, three questions covering crypto assets, grey listing, and Zeronia, respectively. So on the crypto assets, Given the financial sector conduct authority's recent declaration of crypto assets as a financial product under the FICE Act, what are the next steps in regulating crypto assets in South Africa? And there's a second question here. Is South Africa moving fast enough given the recent developments related to FTX? So that's on crypto assets. Then moving on to gray listing. Does the bank feel that it has done everything in its powers to prevent grey listing? And lastly, on Zeronia, can you explain why it is necessary for Zeronia to succeed Jaibar? When does the bank foresee that markets will start using this new rate? Thanks, Governor. Over to you. Uh, uh, th uh, th uh, thank you very much. Yeah, um, the only way in which uh, we could put any regulatory framework on uh, the crypto assets was to characterize them as, or classify them as financial, um, financial products. And once they become financial products, then uh, you can put a regulatory framework uh, in place. The thing about uh, crypto is that um, in many respects, they depict uh, characteristics of um, other financial assets, and they interact with the rest of the financial, the financial system. Globally, we are engaged in, uh, uh, in discussions uh, to uh, set through a framework to uh, deal with, uh, 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 with crypto assets. Uh, are we moving uh, uh, fast enough? Well, this is, becomes a very interesting thing, because uh, when you talk to the players in the 
uh, crypto space for many years, their attitude was that there shouldn't be a regulatory framework. They must be left to do their uh, own thing. Now that people have bent their fingers, um, now they are coming. Uh, they are coming to the uh, to the fourth. From the sub's perspective, our concern is what uh, the cryptos pose, what risks cryptos pose to financial uh, uh, to financial stability. And in the main, it uh, comes through a number of channels, including by players who would access money, borrow money from the normal banking system to invest in crypto assets. When these things uh, collapse, it means that their asset is gone and they still have a liability elsewhere uh, in the financial sector. There is a number of uh, the interactions, but uh, I would um, uh, ask um, uh, either Fundi or Kuben uh, uh, to add. But um, gray listing, as far as gray listing is concerned, we think that the all the actions that the SAP had to take to prevent the grey listing have been taken. As the presenters say, stated, there are other aspects that are outside of the realm of uh, financial regulators um, that must be done to avoid a grey listing, including prosecutions mainly in the criminal justice, uh, uh, criminal justice system. Uh, that is where uh, the thing uh, um, uh, gets stuck. Fundi and um, uh, uh, colleagues from the other agencies of uh, government spent the whole weekend uh, finalizing our submission uh, to FATF, which was uh, submitted uh, before due, uh, due date uh, yesterday uh, on time. Uh, and hopefully we have addressed uh, uh, the concerns that had been uh, that had been raised. Be that as it may, um, with uh, that there is going to have to be an assessment as to whether the steps that we have taken we are demonstrating meaningful progress uh, in plugging uh, plugging the gaps. Zaronia um, Zaronia had to replace Jaiba. Jaiba has its history similar to that of LIBOR. And as the, the, the original name was not the Johannesburg Interbank um, average rate. It was actually the Johannesburg Interbank agreed rate. So it was not a rate at which um, um, uh, the banks were trading. Uh, in the case of Zaronia, um, the banks have got to quote in amounts that they could actually trade in so that it reflects actual market uh, uh, market prices. Uh, I'm not sure of the timeline, uh, 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 Dr. Kasim. That is uh, your yeah, baby. Just just say that th this is an important month, is because for the first time we started publishing uh, the Zeronia rates. So so um, j just to add to what the governor is saying, that w one of the reasons why uh, there is a box. Uh, on Zeronia in, in the financial stability report is we want to kind of make sure that the transition from uh, Jaiba to Zeronia uh, is not handled in an ir irresponsible way. And the last thing you want is for the Saab uh, to contribute to market instability. So the idea is that, you know, we haven't set a definite date. Uh, we think that uh, that a uh, number of banks will use the, once they have a, a year of published uh, Zenodia, I, I struggle with the, with the, with the term, um, once we have the published rates, uh, we will, we will, um, we think that that's when banks will start using it, uh, but we're very careful to, uh, to make sure that we have uh, well published rates and when the time is right, uh, we will then officially uh, move to Zeronia. But we haven't announced the date yet. At the moment, we're very carefully managing uh, the transition. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Yes, Governor. There are two more questions. They relate to cyber attacks and to Cody. So the one on cyber attacks is unfortunately very broad. It asks, how many cyber attacks were there in the period under review? So it doesn't specify the financial sector or the non-financial sector. The second question is, President Ramaphosa 
signed into law the Financial Sector Laws Amendment Act in January. When can we expect Cody to come into play? Okay. Um, how many cyber attacks? I do not have the, uh, uh, the figures. I think that there might even be more attempts than there have been attacks without a, uh, uh, without a doubt. I do, not have, uh, I do not have those statistics unless this uh, esteemed panel uh, has it. Um, uh, yes, Cody, um, the president had signed the uh, uh, financial sector amendment uh, bill to, into an act. And uh, we are busy with the preparations and that there are the first sections that would come into uh, effect on the 1st of April, 2023. Um, we are working diligently to put together the board of the uh, the Cody. Uh, the composition of that board is spelled out in the uh, in the act. It is made up of uh, 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 it's chaired by a deputy governor of the uh, uh, of the Reserve Bank, and would include uh, people from the Treasury, from Fisca, and uh, a, a range of others. It's spelled is spelled out in the act. Um, Fundi. Yeah, just to confirm, Governor, we don't have the numbers on, on cyber attacks on us. Uh, but to highlight that the our number of initiatives that, that we have underway uh, in order to help financial institutions to better manage um, the, the cyber security issues, uh, we did put out um, um, in the past a, a joint standard for consultation uh, on on cyber uh, on cyber security, which is a joint standard uh, put out by the Prudential Authority and the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, we are going to be going out to publish uh, for for second consultation a more refined standard. Uh, but we also have ongoing interactions with financial entities around uh, the cyber security strengthening, uh, including how they interact with third parties that are involved in, uh, in their businesses. So let me, let me stop there, Governor. Thank you. Any further questions? Oh, Kuben. Uh, thank you. Just on the CODI, the Cooperation for Public Deposits, uh, you correct the law has been signed. It is our intention that CODI will be established as a legal entity by the 1st of April 2023 and it will begin to cover deposits. It will begin to insure bank deposits from the 1st of April 2024. So, so those are the two key dates in the, in the timeline. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Good day. We have one more question. Um, any exposure of South African institutions to the crypto assets fallout? I'm not aware of... Uh, uh, of uh, uh, of any um, uh, from the fallout, uh, unless anybody uh, has the thing. But there is an estimate of the um, size of uh, the crypto asset market uh, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. That does not tell us that they are exposed to that fallout. Uh, these things, there are uh, many of uh, these exchanges. Uh, do you have that, Nicola? Um. Yes, Governor, um, we have statistics in, in the third part, third chapter. I'm going to ask my colleague Harku whether he can remember it offhand. Um, it is in the publication. Uh, at this stage, even if some of our financial stability or fin financial institutions have exposure, the size of it wouldn't be of a systemic nature, nature in, in any way. Even in aggregate, we don't regard it as um, big enough to cause financial instability. Crypto, crypto? <laughs> <laughs> Just talk. Oh, is it? Uh, apologies. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I, I think uh, nothing much to add. I think um, domestic institutions um, 
I think the media has uh, included some references to potential linkages, exposure that uh, domestic crypto asset uh, trading platforms have to the uh, compromised uh, foreign-based uh, institutions. Um, but again, just to reiterate what Nicola said, um, even in terms of the, the aggregate uh, volumes of crypto assets traded in RAND value, um, as we've included in Chapter 3 over the last uh, year or so, um, even should there um, be significant exposure by domestic institutions, it would not uh, constitute um, a systemic risk um, from a South African perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Governor, that's a wrap on questions. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Frunshti. Thank you very much, uh, panelists, and thank you all for, uh, for your attendance. Uh, we uh, do welcome the fact that there were such few questions. That means that there aren't much concerns about the stability and resilience of the South African financial uh, system. It has served us well. Thank you very much. That concludes the proceedings of today.